Whoop. Hey everyone! Welcome back to another AMA session! How's everyone doing? We've got Hamish, we've got Leon, we've got Eonard. Lorso Killer. Thanks for the follow, Lorso Killer. How is everyone doing today? This AMA is going to be pretty packed. We got a ton of questions this time. I thought so. Hi, Adam. How's it going? Turn down the music a little bit. That's better. Doing good. How about you? Yeah, doing good. I got up pretty early considering uh, what we usually get up to. <laughs> but ready for a, for a busy AMA session and I'm probably going to be doing some personal work after that. So it's going to be good. Um, your questions, Leon, are going to be at the end of the session, I think. Because I'm going through them in sequence. So, yeah, I would say it's going to be pretty pretty late in the session that we're going to go through your questions. But that's alright though. That's why we have the, the VODs. I still need to update the VOD from last week, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Did I do that? I don't know. Oh, Adam, you're waiting to go on the PC. <laughs> How long do you have to wait? Two, two, two. Okay, let's see. I'm going to double check if we have some more questions coming in. Uh, AMA questions. Nope, we got all of those. Let me double check the anonymous questionnaire. Okay, we got those as well. Cool. Awesome. We'll see how long the current quest line is. <laughs> so you have to wait for the quest line to be finished. And then it's your turn again. It's pretty cool though. Reminds me of like the old school days when there was only one kid in the neighborhood that had like a console or something. So everyone would just go to, to that place and then just wait their turns to play on a console. Yeah, it, it took me a long while since I... Before I had my own console, so I, I usually went up to my friends just to play games. Split screen with one keyboard? Yeah! Or Worms, like the old school Worms on one PC. That was a shit, man. Or um, Medal of Honor Rising Sun with four players on one PlayStation. You had like the, the split thingy right uh what was that called just like a just like a, a dongle that you could add onto like one of the one of the controller slots basically and it would split it into four. Oh, dude i was so advanced <laughs> 
Hot Seat Heroes. I don't think I've heard about that one. Yeah, I, I have one of those. So, well, I had one of those when I had my PlayStation 2, I think. So from that point on, like, instead of me going to my friends, like all my friends would come to me <laughs> just to play uh, Rising Sun. Always leeching other people's gaming consoles. Hey, Zeku, how's it going? Welcome to the AMA session. Super Smash Brothers 1 was the, the go-to for good group sessions. I never had, like, a Nintendo or something. Um, I had, like, a distant nephew that had one. So, that... If I remember correct, that's probably, like, my first gaming experience when... We went there and it was like all the way up in the attic and he only had like one game. It's like, um, what's that called? Super Mario Kart? I don't know which version or or whatever anymore. But that was so awesome. Super Smash. I don't think I've ever played that. Oh, the good old days. BA Nups. Hey man, what's up? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Ready to dive into some questions? I think we're gonna just dive dive straight in. Um we have a lot of them this week. So I'm I'm thinking that this is gonna be a pretty long session. I might condense the questions a little bit. Normally we go into like full on rants and like discussions, right? Um but I'll try to condense it a little bit from my side. If this is like a discussion panel, right? Um, so we're going to go through these questions. But if you have anything to say. Or if you have any point that you want to make or anything that you want to throw into the conversation, feel free to do so. Like then we can discuss it and go into a little bit more depth of it. Um, if you have any additional questions that latch on to the main question, just feel free to fire away. Just joined the community recently. Oh yeah. Thanks so much, man. That's awesome. And welcome to the community. All right. Let's dive into some questions though. First question is from Anonymous. How much time is given to complete a prop like the military radio? And let's say if you're not able to complete it in your given time, can you ask for more time? This is a good question, right? It's... It's basically talking about your first interactions with like proper scheduling and like scheduling your own tasks. Um, first, how much time would you be given for that kind of prop? If it's like a fully unique prop, in this case, the military radio, I think it's a tutorial from Tim Berghals from Champer Zone, if I'm not mistaken. I might be wrong on that one. Um, for that prop, let's see. Simon Fush? Okay. Good. Thanks for the correction. Um, it was either one of those. It was like 50-50. I bet on the wrong wrong horse in that one. Um, but how much time would you be given to complete something like that? Is probably... What would I say? It's Sometimes it's really tricky to say in a development because... Some stuff might change, um, but if it's like a purely zero to one, no adjustments whatsoever, no feedback, um, it might be a week, a week and a half, maybe two weeks if I'm being generous. And we're also talking about eight hours a day working on it, right? Um, I'm trying to build with this with this estimation. I'm also trying to build in like a buffer for like any bumps in the road that can happen. And this is also my estimation. So your estimation as a junior might be a little bit higher because it's your first prop. You're not really 100% comfortable with baking. Um, but let's say, let's say from, from my angle, let's say two weeks or something. Um, then the next part of this question is, what if you don't make it in those two weeks? for example. Can you ask for more time? Yeah, that's 100% fine. Um, that's also why I mentioned that I build in this buffer of 
like there is already like a little bit of a buffer in those two weeks, but say you're unsure about the texturing or the the baking of the normal map, if there's any any um discrepancy there or if you're not sure about anything in there just add a little bit more of a buffer so let's say a month for example um that could that could also be like a good estimation um so yeah it's totally fair to ask for more time 100 percent um when I was given my first assignment, which was to build a train station, I was giving twice the amount of time of an experienced artist. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what likely will happen too. I think for my first couple of assignments, I got given like way more time than than was mentioned, like an experienced artist, because you're getting to grips with the pipeline, you're getting to grips with the programs, which are usually not the programs that you're comfortable with working. You get used to well, if we're talking about the game engine, right? A lot of us artists are, are used to working with Unreal Engine and how that works. And we kind of have this idea if we cater our texturing in this way, then we know that it's going to look like this in the engine. But that might be completely different depending on the proprietary engine that you will be using. Um, but that's a really good point. Your, your lead or the person assigning the task to you will definitely take your level into account and will try to... Uh, give you a buffer to to get used to the entire pipeline. Um, next question is from Guillaume Pavon. Um, let's have a look. How do you know when to stop working on a big portfolio project and call it done? I could work forever on small things, improving things that may maybe are not worth the time near the effort. So this is another good question, right? It's it's deciding when the project is done. Um, there, there are a lot of factors that come into this, um, such as how you're feeling about the about the project. If you're feeling good about it and you still want to work on it, um, if we're just going by that metric, I would keep going for a little bit, do those little things. Um, but on the other side. Say if you if you're already if you're already kind of kind of bored or you want to move on to the next thing, it might be good to just cut it off here or finish up like the last bits, right, and move on to the presentation and finalize it there, and then move on to the next thing. Um, because usually what happens is that you have this initial learning curve where you learn a lot in the beginning of a project, but then at the end of the project, like that goes down and down again because you're getting into more familiar territory again and you're not doing like crazy experiments with i don't know like the procedural placement of foliage or whatever it can be right um so that's also why a lot of people say or give give the suggestion of keeping your stuff really small so that you can just Focus on like the learning aspect and really push yourself to like that next level and basically get rid of all the fat where it's just was just you iterating and like experimenting and while well, mostly iterating um, and not learning anything new. Um, so, yeah. But you bring up a good point, though. Um, improving things that may that maybe are not worth the time needed the effort that is something that is well worth mentioning too because sometimes people spend too much time on stuff that is going to be in like a corner that's really dark and you're not going to see it anyway so why would you spend so much time on it focus put all your love and attention into the hero prop like the focus point of your scene and then have like other props that support it, but maybe are not like 100% perfectly textured. They don't need to be because they're just supporting like the main element. Um, Seku, I opted to cut it where it was and move on to the next project. That's good. 
I think that's a good choice. It's good to recognize that it's all right. I've gotten all the learning that I could have, and just move on to like the next thing. I think that's a really good realization. Uh, I made this statement and I don't like it. Well, this is the thing, right? I think, I think it doesn't really matter which seniority or like which level that you're at as an artist. You're always going to run into this issue of like, okay, like where is the drop-off point? For some people, it's easier. But if we're talking about my work, for example, I'm always, I'm always thinking about expanding and making it more interesting and then it's like oh but what if i do like multiple camera angles and we're kind of going into scoping the project and i'm also again i keep saying this on every stream i'm in a position where i don't have to be worried about getting stuff done just to get my portfolio up to up to speed and then getting a job right um so that is a huge factor take that into account because if I were to have like a deadline like that, I would probably be condensing my environment and like finishing like an environment every, every, let's say three to six months or something. Spending way too much time on the little things that occupy a little screen space. Sometimes it's worth it. If you're doing like a close up shot and you have like a bunch of trinkets that really help sell the scene or they're like really nicely textured that gives the that gives like a potential recruiter like a good insight and can really help like the narrative of your scene too but if you're not going to go through the trouble of like zooming in or like including them in your um panning shots or your fly through from your scene then don't spend the time on it just leave it i would always go from the biggest stuff down to the smaller stuff where if you're at some point you 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 feel that you just don't want to do this anymore that you already have all the big stuff in place and the smaller stuff are the smaller stuff is usually easier to cut out so yeah um let's see i could work forever on small things improving things yeah, I think uh, I think you made a good choice there, Seku. I think you made a good choice. Um, all right. Next question we got one from Omar S. What is the importance of wireframe and good polyflow in models? I've adjusted this question a little bit because it was really long and really lengthy. Um, there is a second part of this question too, where he where he asked like considering where the technology is heading and how less and less important the poly count is is it relevant to nitpick on the wireframes of props so this is basically a question that goes into um that goes into how how big the importance of polyflow and like wireframes and and like good poly count is uh Especially the second part of the statement, like looking at where the technology is heading. You got to be careful that you don't only look at the technology that's available to us as um, environment artists outside of the industry. You have to look at the, the proprietary engines too, and also what games are being made in them. Because say for AAA games, for AAA open world massive open world games that might be true up until a certain point because if you look at the if you look at the smaller models if you look at the smaller props they're still like really optimized they don't they don't really waste any any polygons on that like they they can't afford to um because they're rendering so much in like the camera thrust room when you're moving through a space that every prop in in that camera needs to be needs to be optimized so it is really important if we're talking about the poly count and the wireframes um let's have a look is it relevant to nitpick on the wireframes of props like a handbag for example i think it is because it's one of those fundamentals that say in the future you're 
poly count isn't an issue on some games, that might happen, right? I'm this is like a really big caveat, and we're talking about like way in the future where maybe we're more reliant on poly um cloud what is it like point clouds and all that stuff to render to render architecture um to render assets i mean um but there is always going to be a segment of the games industry that might still rely on good polyflow and good poly count and especially the space that we're in right now it's still really important so i would definitely clean up the wireframes, the poly count. Usually it doesn't take too much time. Um, if we're talking about a handbag, for example, in this case, it doesn't hurt to go through it manually. I don't mean from scratch, building building like well, retopologizing the entire thing. What I'm what I'm more talking about is you usually already have a low poly model. Just taking your time to clean it up a little bit and to make sure that um, like the, the the edges are in the correct space, that they contribute to the silhouette, which is always a really important point, and that they're balanced throughout the throughout the prop. So that if you have a button on like a handbag which is like super small, don't spend like 64 edges on that one little button on like a handbag. It, it needs to be in balance with like the rest of the handbag too, right? Um, so <laughs> up until this point, we've been talking about assets, right? Like static assets. Um, I think in your original question, you also brought up um, decimation and natural assets too. That's where it's a little bit different, right? Um, because usually they rely more well, they heavily rely on their edges and it is usually trickier to optimize them manually. So that's where decimation comes in um, because they also don't need to be animated. And that's a point that you brought up as well, um, which which I kind of uh, cut out of the question. Because that's also an important thing that you have to keep into account. You have to keep into account like the animation of it, like how how is this going to be animating in in game and just taking that into account too um but yeah i think it's still it is still relevant to not necessarily nitpick on the wireframes but to have clean uh poly counts and like polyflow for sure Um, thanks for the answer. Yeah, Tim, thanks for the answer on my question as well. Yeah, no worries. Um, we're gonna get to, uh, since it, it, it got kind of brought up as like an anonymous question, right? Um, we're, we're gonna have like a, another anonymous question too, like in, in a bit, so. Um, but first... Would you be willing to go over how you plan your trim sheet and how they are divided to get a good mix between unique details and reusability, please? This is from Cairo Goodbrand. Um, yeah, for sure. Let's have a look at it, right? Um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about how I'm going to do this. Um, do I just go in Blender or do I go in Unreal? I might just stick with Blender for now. Let's just boot that one up. Uh, I'm going to load up my high poly for my wooden kit. Just give me a second. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah, we got some really good questions. And um, Banups, thanks for the follow as well. I appreciate it. Got some really good questions today. All right. So this is opened up. Let me just switch my screen to uh, uh, uh. main screen. There we go. So. 
Um, let's have a look. What was the question? Would you be willing to go over how you plan your trim sheets? That is a really good question because there's a lot of factors that come into that, right? Um, usually how I start out with planning a trim sheet is looking at the widths of the main support structures that I need. So for this wooden kit, I was looking at some really thick beams and then like some smaller edges of planks. That was my upper and lower limit. So I knew that I had to have like a plank width roughly, which can also be used for beams. If you just make them longer, right? They can use, they can be used for beams as well. Um, and then these are like the smallest ones, which are like the edges of planks roughly, because not everything mapped onto a trim sheet is going to be hundred percent perfect. Sometimes you might, um, I explained that there is, um, well, I didn't explain it on stream, but I was talking to some people that usually there is an amount of deviation that you can have from your ideal textile density. Whereas for, for usually all my cases, I use like a 15% margin roughly. There's also some artistic insight or like some creativity that comes into that. But usually I know that if I stretch it more than 15%, I'm going to end up with either I'll have to move it to like one of the one of the thicker planks or I'm going to end up with some stretching. So I need to find like a different solution for that. Um, but yeah, so... I knew that I had these four and then these four for my upper and lower limit. And then thinking about that rule of like 15%, I kind of wanted to have something in between. So I created four, um, four additional beams or like sections that are basically half the width of my plank here, just to give me some more variation between them. And then obviously I can I can kind of bridge the gap between those two. So let's say I'm looking at my textile density and it's it is kind of too small for this. I'm not I don't want to stretch it out to the edges. I can just move it onto one of these instead. Um So that is usually how I go into the planning of it when it comes to the main structural details, right? Um, but then I still needed to keep in mind that I wanted to do some like unique or like the ends of it, um, which basically like the ends here can be mapped onto like this, this plank, for example. And then I have, I have like a bunch of ends for like each variation basically. So say if I only have like a small plank, I can use one of these. If I have one of the big beams, I can use one of these. Um, there's still some stuff here that is kind of open. I'm not sure if I'm going to need these, but it gives me some options, right? Um, same for this one, by the way. I'm not sure if I'm going to put anything here because currently it's just like a, a tile ball where I can map like uneven spaces or... Maybe a a chair or something like the top of a chair, which is like a rounded surface. I can just map that onto this onto this section, and it gives me like a, a larger surface to work with instead of having these separations between them. Um. Yeah, and then and then I started thinking about like all the additional details that I wanted to project on top of it. So we have these kind of kind of things which are like mesh decals that I use on top of it so you can see that people hammered like wooden pegs or like medieval nails into the surface which is just to add like an additional layer on top of it same for these like these mesh decals um this was also empty space before 
because I knew that I wanted to keep something or that I wanted to add something there, but I, I wasn't sure what. So at some point I decided that my trim sheet wasn't looking... It didn't really bridge the gap between a trim sheet and like the unique look that I was going for. So I knew that I had to layer stuff on top of the trim sheet to make it look closer to as if it was a uniquely detailed mesh. So I started experimenting with some of these broken edges and then some of these mesh decals where I can overlay this on top of one of these sections and I can have it look like it's it's like been damaged over time by by like this could be like the top of a wooden car where boxes get pushed into it and it damages like the wooden surface on top of it. Um, let me actually quickly look for a screenshot for that. That might make a little bit more sense. Because the 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 thing that I was trying to do with this with this trim sheet was I wanted to have something really modular. But I didn't want to really sacrifice the quality of it. So that's where I got into like all these layers on top of it. That's why I'm also working with like the second UV layout so I can layer stuff on top of it. Everything. I'm basically doing everything to get me closer to bridge that gap. Um, so here you can see like an example with just a trim sheet. This isn't doing anything uh, fancy in the shader yet. Well, you can see that this is just a normal trim sheet, but then I add like this damaged section on top of it to add more more um, interest to the surface. Same for these wooden pegs, like they make a connection with these with these spokes, which looks really nice. Um, but yeah, how do I go about planning this all? I knew that I needed, like, this was the core, basically. So, all of this that I have currently selected, I knew that I needed those components to make, like, the base of the kit working. And then, this was just, like, empty space. At, at some point, I was like, okay, maybe some broken edges would be cool. I knew that I wanted to do something like it, but I didn't really have an idea on how, just yet. Um, So, yeah, this is... This is just like open space up until a point where I had some stuff to fill it up again. Um, but most of the trim sheet here, because that's also the second part of your question, right? Um, how to get that good mix between unique details and reusability is because it's a trim sheet, I focus on the reusability and like the core fundamentals of the sheet first before adding extra bits on top of it. All right, I hope that helps. Uh, let me switch back here. Yeah, here we are again. Let me put my questions right there. Cool, let me get a sip of water. Did that make sense so far? If there's any any questions about any of the topics that we discussed today, feel free to just type in the chat and we'll we'll go over it again. I don't mind. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um All right. Time into some more questions though. We got another one from Anonymous. I want to learn Unreal Engine and want to create environments in it. What would be the better way to learn? Get into a project directly and learning along with it? Or just learn the fundamental concepts first and then dive into it? Um, that's a good question. It depends on how, how you learn the best. Um, because usually if we look at a traditional way of learning, I would say get into the fundamental concepts first. Um, if you're really starting from scratch, I would I would probably dive into the fundamentals first. 
dive into um what is it like composition some color usage like really the theoretical fundamentals of art i would start there um if we're talking about a stage where you're already familiar with that stuff but are just learning to get into unreal in my personal case it's usually the best where i have something of a plan or like an environment in my head something really small but that can that get that can push me into getting familiar with the engine um that's the same way i did it with blender as well like i knew that from when i switched to blender i wanted to make an environment that was purely made in blender or like modeled in blender right because i'm still doing the presentation in unreal engine but i just switched and then i had to go through like all the pains of like okay how am i how am i modeling this how am i cutting stuff up like how basically the basis of modeling um basically where to find everything again um that is always a good way for me to learn stuff because i learn by doing i hate sitting around and listening to other people explain it i need to be doing stuff at the same time like i i'm a very practical learner instead of like a theoretical learner i was never i was never really good at just listening to stuff i always wanted to do stuff with my hands and like get into contact with it and like experience experiment with it with myself so i would say think about what kind of person you are if you're really good at like the theoretical learnings um look at tutorials look at the documentation um try to follow along with some uh presentations from people that have that are, that are building some stuff in unreal engine um but personally i always need to have something on hands so my recommendation would probably be to get into like a project directly and then really really start for small don't overthink it don't start with making like a giant space just like really start small with like one room or something like a corner of a room that gives you some time to experiment with just how to get stuff into the engine how how to move stuff about how to get used to the material editor for example um because you don't want to be working on like an open world type of environment from the beginning because that will literally kill your motivation you have to start small and slowly but surely build up from that point um also if you're doing this unreal engine has like a learning tab that is really awesome they have they have tutorials for everything on there they have i think they even have a track where it teaches you to become an environment artist so have a look at that i think that's a really good starting point um Oh, okay. I see what I did here. I was confused because there's another question from Cairo, but it basically latches on to the previous question. So when talking about trim sheets, um, he asks, how do you avoid, oh damn, I forgot this section. Now I need like this kind of section. Um, it's kind of weird, right? Because that's how I literally built my stuff. It's like I keep some empty space where I can have those, oh damn, I need to add stuff. I can still add stuff there. Um, he also mentions um, section, the grid, etc. Which is also really important because it helps you with snapping. So usually what I try to do is I have my planks or like my divisions aligned with the uv grid so that if i want to snap my uvs for like a certain plank i can just do that with snapping instead of like manually trying to move stuff 
that is really going to help you with speeding up the process of it. So that's a good point. That's a, a very a good point. Uh, but yeah, I don't think you should avoid... Oh, damn, I forgot this section. I need to do... I need to do X. Always keep like a little bit of an open space where you can add stuff to it. I think that's that's really, really good. In my opinion. You can you can really heavily go into the planning of a trim sheet and have maybe even like sketch it out in 2D on like a piece of paper. Just be like, okay, this is like the section for my planks. This is section for my mesh decals if you want to have those. This is a section for my my ends of the wooden wooden pieces. Um, I sort of did that planning in 3D. So I I had like really rough shapes, just like cubes with like a bevel on the edges so I could distinct, um, distinguish them from each other. And I would just move them into, into the space and look at my, my available space and just fill it up with stuff that I needed. So I would have like my planks laid out, my ends laid out and then I noticed that I think at some point I noticed that I had not enough space for some of the ends so I moved I removed like a couple of planks or something I had more I think I had more smaller planks in the beginning so I think that's that's also a good way of doing it if you're talking about purely planning it have like a, a 2d 2d sketch or like a 3d sketch really quickly put together <clears throat> bum, bum, bum. let's have a look here we're halfway through the questions no i i don't think you even were halfway through this this is probably the the best ama session that we've done so far in terms of like the amount of questions it's really amazing Who in the chat has experience with with trim sheets? And any tips on how to on how to plan for them? I would be curious to to hear what you guys think. Maybe I can I can learn a thing or two. Limited. <laughs> I think that's the interesting thing about trim sheets. They're they're so versatile. Like I took too hard the advice that as a newbie I should do it backwards. What do you mean with that? Do it backwards. Oh yeah, that's a really good point. I agree. Because that's also basically what I what I did with my trim is I based it off a concept, right? And I had this image in my mind like what what I needed for like an entire city. Well, I say entire city, but we're literally talking about like the wooden the wooden construction for a city. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's also how how I kind of did it then. Um, but because with that image in mind, it's way easier to kind of imagine, to kind of imagine like the different widths and like the different things that you need instead of trying to plan a trim and then build stuff with that trim. I plan pretty much the same as you with space to add if you need more. But often there's that part that is the unknown part. But as you have done on your Timber 1, have a tileable ish section here for the odd shaped UV islands. Yeah, that is also the thing, right? There always is going to be like a little bit of an unknown part. There might be some some stuff that might just come later where you're like oh i have like this base set but what if i want to do like this i don't know what could be like a good example like this unique pattern for example this unique pattern that's carved into the wood but it's it's going to be unique in a way that you can use it as a trim then 
you kind of need to shove some stuff about or maybe use the existing space for that pattern specifically. Um, so that could always happen. And it's good to kind of to kind of keep that in mind. It's it's sort of like any plan, right? Like the more you plan and the more strict you are with that plan, as soon as something of a hurdle comes up, it just falls into a water and there's no plan B. I think a plan a plan needs to have some ambiguity in mind where you're not planning everything to to a T, but you're like leaving some room for for stuff to go awry, basically. So that you're not you're not panicking when when like you you say, like there's that unknown part that you eventually stumble upon and it's like, oh my god, I I don't have space anymore. But that being said, um, I'm gonna let me have a look, right? Because since you're in the chat anyway, um, hey Mish, let me just link your tutorial, right? Where is it? Where is it? There we go. So if you're interested, I'm just gonna plug your your tutorial, hey Mish. I was just about to bring that up too, that there's so many different ways that you can do trims. Um, so you can have like a, a trim that is only like trim sheets, like it's only the wooden planks and only, only the stuff that you need to make like the structural stuff. But you can also have like unique details in there, like the, the hybrid trim technique that you, that you mentioned is sort of like a, a good, a good overview of that. Hey, Lord. Hey, Cairo. Welcome, guys. Yeah, really useful. Hey, Mish. I agree. Just looking at your trim, I feel I'll do a version 3.0. I know I can do better. Well, I think this also goes back to, to the question of Zeku, right? Like, maybe it's good enough. Maybe you don't need to go back and like redo it and like spend a lot of time on redoing it. Maybe you just need to realize that you can do better this time and just take those lessons into like the next time. Because I think that's fair enough. Because you don't want to be iterating like over and over on, on like a thing that is maybe not even worth it. I don't know all the background of your scene, right? But if we, we looked at your scene together yesterday and it was looking awesome, man. Okay. Uh, yeah, Cairo, you just joined when, <laughs> when we literally discussed your, your questions. I think we, we just ended with that one. Um... So, let's move on to your questions, Adam. Um, I broke them up into two parts. I think it's a really interesting question. I do want to look at it from two different perspectives. So, how do you get noticed and recognized in the first months of your job? Outside of doing your part well and on time, how do you make a name for yourself in a studio and get recognized for your strengths? Um, I mean, again... A really good question. Uh, you also mentioned that this is specifically apart from doing a good job and being on time. But honestly, I think that is the best way to get recognized. Because all the rest sort of feels like fluff to me. Like, I don't know, maybe... Because I always think that you you want to be known for what you love to do, right? So in this case, doing like a good job, being really reliable, being versatile in situations, um, from like a professional angle, that's how I want to present myself. If we're if we're gonna look at my case, right? Um, that's always how I try to present myself too. Like there was there was some weird stuff that was thrown at me, but I would never say no. I would just be like, okay, I'm open for the challenge. I'm going to bite into it and I'm going to see it through. 
um, and that sort of sort of grew over time. Um, it's not something that is achievable in the first few months. I think you're gonna plant the seeds in the first few months, but it's really after after a year or a year and a half where people are gonna be like, "Yeah, I've worked with in your case like Adam a couple of times, and like the stuff that he's doing is really great. Like he's always on the ball, like he's always on time. Really great to communicate with too, which is a really important skill too. Um, and you kind of have to see it on the long term." The way that I also see it is that it's it's not only for that company that you're doing. Like the stuff that you're doing in this company is also going to affect like other people. Um, I think it was, I think we discussed this with you, Adam, where we had a discussion of how you entered the Discord community. And it was through um, Louis, Louis Labram. Uh, a person who is best friends with like my mentor at Frontier. Yeah, exactly, right? I'm I'm remembering that correctly. So I think that is a good example. Like I had never worked together with Lewis. And I know that this is not like professional, it's more like the community itself, but it's it's because through Chris Martin that I was doing I was doing um I was doing my job. I was being professional about it. I was always interested in doing stuff outside of work. That I was always pretty open about that too. And I think that just builds like a character over time. And again, you have to see it in the long term where at this point you joined the community because I did a good job at Frontier, which is like three years ago. Right? Right? So that's that's the way you have to see it, like it's it's more over the long term instead of like the initial initial couple of months. It's yeah, it is it is just really long term that you have to play it. Like it doesn't matter if you're playing the short game. Like you you need to focus on like the long game. Um, to bring it back to the professional environment though, um. Yeah, it kind of does. Um, but it's it's how you present yourself to that network. Because the, the thing I've also seen is that people... People tend to overestimate the value of networking sometimes. Where their work is... Or like their professional attitude and their work is not up to par with what they could have achieved if they spend all that time working on their work instead of talking. If that makes sense. Because I was never... I was never that interested in networking, to be honest. I was just interesting, interested in doing environment art. Like, I was doing that on the side. I was talking about it with people. I was... I was just really interested in that. I would never... I mean, I've been through, like, a couple of conferences. But it always felt, like, really awkward to me. Like, just talking to people to, to like, connect with them. I was like, if if someone's gonna be on my path and we're gonna become friends, like so be it. Like I'll I'll take it. But I I wasn't really looking looking to network if that makes sense. Because yeah, I think that's that's just a way better a way better way of handling it. Like you're getting known for for being really passionate about something instead of talking a lot. If that makes sense. I'm not saying this is you in... in no, oh, sorry. I'm not saying that this is you in this case, right? Um, but I've seen people in the industry that get really far by just talking. I just don't want to be... I don't want to be that person. I want to be known for being good at my work. And being really friendly and helpful. And, and all that stuff. Instead of only thinking about like networking anyway to come back to your question though because this is more like a a general thing right um let's have a look um 
Yeah, I think I think you just have to you have to keep at it. Keep doing good work. Um keep keep on it. Like um be consistent. I think that's also a really big thing. I was I always try to be really consistent about my stuff. That when people ask me something, I would always try to deliver at the same sort of level. Like there was no compromise. I wouldn't have well, I would try to not have like bad days where it's just like, oh, I don't feel like it. Like I'm I'm not going to do something or I'm going to slack on this or whatever. I would always try to have my output at like a reliable level. Um, and yeah, like after a while that pays off. It's just, it takes a long time before it does. And I think that's also, that's also fair. Because... This is this is going into like a, a bit of a rant about just like everything, but I don't really believe in like the instant gratification thing or like the quick gratification thing where oh I wanna get recognized in in like a couple of couple of months or like a couple of weeks, I wanna be this guy. It's like no, you have to literally build that up over over long times, like over long periods. Um it's cool to see that in the business we're in, we're doing a good job. Does actually get you recognized and appreciated. Better fresh air after what I'm used to. Yeah, exactly. And even though it might not be... Maybe it's sort of diminished on like a professional level. Or it might feel like that. Because sometimes... Um, what would it be? Like... What am I trying to say? Like sometimes there's a difference between the input that you get from professionals compared to outside of it, right? Like from a community or whatever. Um, but yeah, you definitely get recognized and appreciated and you get known in the industry. It just takes, it takes a while for all that to build up. Um, then we get to the second part of your question. And this was pretty interesting. Because you you brought up in your question how to get recognized with for your strengths and doing well and all that stuff. But how does this change with working from home when you don't have that social contact and you don't you don't have that direct connection with, with other team members? I think that's a really interesting topic. Um do you do you maybe want to elaborate on what you're feeling? I feel I feel like you're you're missing something there, right? Um and in the same time I'll try to discuss because this is such an interesting topic but I never really thought about it myself. But I think in general it does it does hurt you though. Like there's there's this there's this interaction that you're used to with working with other people in the industry, like working in the same room. Um, yeah, exactly. The water cooler conversations, talking about personal work. A lot of that stuff happened when we went we went to grab like a coffee or a tea or or something. And that's not really happening anymore with working from home. So Man, I wonder, yeah. I wonder what, like, the long-term effect of that is. I'm trying to think... I'm trying to think about, like, comparative situations with freelancers, for example. Hmm. But then, yeah, freelancers are, like, a different thing, right? Because they're so... They're usually so specialized in like one thing that usually their work stands out because they're so specialized in it whereas comparatively if you're a studio artist in this case you have to you have to wear like a couple of different hats like you're not just working on one thing and then moving on to the other like well usually you are but there's also like other things that come with it um Yeah, that's a really good question. How does this change? I think it it definitely changes for 
for the worse. Um, like you said, the water, water cooler conversations, um, people just walking by your desk, like just just looking at the stuff that you're doing and then like, oh, that's cool. Like, yo, oh, what, what are you making? Like that kind of interaction doesn't really happen anymore. Um, so that's a really interesting point. I wonder if there are ways to circumvent that where, for example, you have a workroom on Slack or Discord or whatever the company uses for their communication and that if you're up for it, you can just be there share your screen and then other people can hop in and have like like uh, like the personal workroom that we have in the in the community that might be interesting obviously there's like a whole bunch of security questions that come with that but yeah i think i think it hurts it definitely hurts you a little but you're still delivering the items. You're still delivering the assets. You're still delivering the work to the game. So the eventual product is still there. Um, and you still have some meetings for like art meetings to discuss stuff too. So yeah. We have Learning Fridays where we have someone showing the topic of interest to the rest. i have doing some... Uh, substance painter sections over the last couple of weeks. Closest to guests to chat at work and getting to know people. I think that's good though. I think that's a really interesting thing. We we sort of have the same con concept where it's more separated though. Like we we have like uh, TGI Fridays where um, talent growth investment Fridays. I think. Where every Friday afternoon you can work on 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 something that will boost your um, skill level, like professional skill level, or like professional output. But it's yeah, it's it's sort of isolated, right? There's no connection between people. I think we're trying to solve that, but it's it's difficult. Yeah, I hope. I hope that sort of answers your question, though. It's a really interesting point. I wanna, I wanna think about it and explore that a little bit more. Because working from home in general, it it does. Oh man, I feel I feel a little bit bad for like people starting in the industry and then working from home because they don't get that connection. They don't feel. This this is gonna sound so so high and mighty, but they don't feel that that industry connection. Like, you finally made it, you're in the industry, and then nothing changes. You're still at your desk. Like, you're still in the same chair. Like, nothing changes. So is that... I mean... It, it kind of turns into, like, if we want to be really pessimistic about it, um, it kind of turns into, like, oh, why did I work for this? Like, all these years. Like, was this it? Hmm. For all of us in the channel, we won't have that studio experience for a while. Yeah, exactly. I hope that changes, though. And I hope in the future, there's going to be like a really good balance between working from home and, and in-studio experience. Where, for example, you have managers or leads that are more frequently in the studio to help support the juniors. I think I think there's gonna be there's gonna be a good balance in the future. I think it's gonna be a little while before the industry figures that out and then take like best practices from like one studio to another and like implements it. But I think it's definitely gonna happen. All right. Home visits from a lead to have a cup of a cup of tea and chat. Oh, that would be interesting too. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from inviting them over anyway, right? <laughs> Um, Angelo also mentions that this is a really interesting topic and I would love to have a discussion about um, this is on to like your point Adam and I totally agree like it's it's really interesting looking at it from that perspective um, in addition to that Angelo asks 
could you share some thoughts on how you tackle language barriers when working on studios in the EU, apart from the UK where everyone speaks English? I feel like you've talked about this before, so feel free to ignore that if that's the case. Um, I don't actually think we talked about this before. This is an interesting, interesting topic. Um... Because obviously working at Ubisoft is like really international. So we have calls with like all over the place. Like I've been in, I've been in calls with all over the place. Like you, you name it, like uh, Canada, the Philippines, France, like uh, how do you tackle language barriers? Um, find common ground, right? Um, English is always like the common language where everyone defaults to. Usually the people, the people that I talk to, they do have like a good understanding of English though. Obviously there's like heavy dialects. There's some, some words that get kind of lost in translation, but, uh, it depends on the kind of language. Maybe there's someone else that can like clarify that during like a meeting, for example. Um... But I would be interested... Oh, for example, Cairo, you, you mentioned that you personally struggle with language barriers quite a lot. Can you give an example? Because I don't think I've struggled with language barriers that often. I'm trying to think about an example myself, but... Yeah, like, even with the Philippines, like, there was... I mean, even with the, with the people in, in our studio, some people have like a really heavy dialect. They might have a different culture that they come from. But everyone can speak English at like an understandable level. So it just takes a little bit more effort from like both parties invested, like involved, to just clear up some inconsistencies and be be really upfront and open about that. Where it's like, oh, you mentioned this. Can you maybe explain that? And don't leave it at this like ambiguity level where it's like, oh, I didn't really, I didn't really understand him or her, but I mean, I'll just figure it out. No, I think you just need to be really open about that. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to hear some viewpoints about this as well, because... Mm. Okay. Yeah, also, just to mention, like, English isn't my first language either. Um, oh, okay, that's a good point. Feedback coming over, like, the, like across the wrong way. Um, yeah. <sighs> yeah. Okay, that's that's like a, a clear example. I think with that, it just comes over to just clarifying, asking questions, being really open about it. Um, but I do understand, though. Sometimes, sometimes stuff do does get lost in translation, where you have a, a lead or a person giving you feedback. It might. Yeah, well, what usually my tactic is, is use, like, use, like, questions to diffuse it a little bit. Where you, where you might have a situation that you think is, like, oh my god, they're just, like, ripping my stuff apart. But it might also be, like, a cultural thing. It might also be not knowing the words to, like, soften, soften the feedback up. Um, so usually... Usually, like, a question like, oh, can you, like, explain a little bit more? Or, like, can you elaborate more on this on this topic? Like, there's, there's like, a specific thing about the composition that I didn't really get. Um, and then, usually, what happens in a lot of the cases is that once they start to explain it a little bit more, then you can really see how they meant it. And it kind of diffuses that, that whole, like, aggressiveness that comes with it. Uh, yeah, local slang is also one of one of the things that you just need to just need to ask about it. 
just be really inquisitive about it and just be like, hey, like this word, what does it mean? Like, because I think, and I truly believe this, is that no one in a company is like outwardly trying to do harm or like say anything bad about your work um, unless you have like a really toxic person, right? Um, but usually that's the outliers. So that's the exception, not the rule. So usually once you start asking questions, it's more like, oh, okay, like I can understand where you're coming from. Um, I thought it was, I don't know, like about the composition, but instead it's, it's like, it's maybe the colors that are wrong instead of the composition. That makes sense. Okay, now I have something actionable to work on and I can, I can take this to like the next level. Yeah, I would, I would say elaboration is always the best thing. I do understand that it's 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 really uncomfortable. I mean, imagine if you have someone giving like really uh direct feedback and then you're asking them like, "Wait, wait, wait, can you can you elaborate on on this part?" And I don't know, there might be a situation where where that feels really really weird to do. But I think I think it might be good to to maybe after the meeting, let's say this is in the meeting, like just take them apart, like uh, take them separate, and then um and be like, okay, like I know that you that you discussed like the whole composition of this piece, but I didn't understand what you meant with like this this word here. Yeah, exactly. Well, that is that is the big thing, right? If both sides wants to communicate, then they then they will find common ground. Um, but I think, I think in most cases where you have situations like this, and you have good team members, even though they might be a little bit blunt, they always have like the right intent with it. They might, they might not word it in like a specific way. Uh, that's also where being really objective about your work, if we're talking about feedback again, you, you kind of have to build in this like objectivity where it's like, okay, like this is not a personal attack. This is more like an improvement suggestion that was honestly maybe a little bit blunt from, from their side. But if you do, if you, if you just be, be objective about it, distance yourself from that and just ask a couple of questions, it might... <sighs> Honestly, like communication is so crucial. This is this is why this is also like a really important topic to to bring up because I've seen situations where I'm just like wondering why this ever happened. Like it it, it should have never um how should I say it? Like it should have never gotten to this point where both sides are like, oh my god, they're wrong and they're wrong and blah blah blah. It's like, no, like let's sit together talk about what we want to achieve listen to the first point listen to the second point find common ground that's it i mean it's an oversimplification because there's different personalities different cultures all that stuff going into it too right but if you put in if you put in the effort then you're always going to find it and this is also why i find it important that you have to do this on every level it doesn't matter if you're a junior senior lead whatever you always have to be open to communicate even as a junior if you see that something is something is a little bit weird like just ask about it and just be like hey why why are we doing this composition in this piece because it might lead to like a, b a better end result in the end um also expect to run into speed bumps when it comes to that right as a junior asking asking about like the composition of this piece um usually they're open and receptive about that because you're an artist too um and you're trying to improve the the, the project but it's also from your end as a junior that this is your first time communicating in a team maybe right i'm just naming like a uh a hypothetical example here where you need to work on your communication too so there might be moments where 
you're really upfront or like maybe a little bit too too upfront with a person and you didn't intend it take the time to explain it and if you see if if you well this is it's obviously trickier when when working from home but if you notice that they they're kind of like confused or like distraught by like wait where is this coming from just take a little bit of time to explain it and maybe realize that you might be in the wrong too um but i think if everyone gets this this level of ownership in in like any any type of situation i think it's going to lead to like a better environment for everyone cuz exactly like you said adam just just got to have the right intent Yep, exactly, Cairo. Exactly. That's also what makes it interesting bringing it back to interviews, right? And getting that job. Usually people, as artists, we focus so much on the technical skills, like the hard skills. But usually what I look for are the soft skills. Like, is this a person... That is that is easy going. Like, can I talk to this person? Are they open to feedback? Are they open to criticism? Are what happens when they're stressed? What happens when when they're out of their comfort zone? Like, do they ask questions or are they just like, mm, I'm not going to do anything and just freeze in a moment? I think all those skills are like really important, especially when it comes to soft skills. You can't underestimate them. Because we, I think I I mentioned this like a couple AMAs ago, that we had a killer artist, like an artist that everyone in the team was so excited about getting onto the team, but then we couldn't we couldn't talk to them. There was there was no way that we could that we could work with them, and it's such a shame. Because it would have been it would have been awesome to have them, but we had to deny them on the basis of soft skills. So yeah, that was really unfortunate. But that is like an extreme example too, right? Uh, yeah, this is a good question, Angelo. Thanks so much for, for asking it. Um, Leon, let's dive into some of your questions. I don't know if you're still in the chat. You might be too busy working on your stuff. So keep at it, man. Um, let's have a look. I didn't split this one up, so this is going to be a lengthy question. Um, since I am personally working on a relatively edgy... <laughs> oh, he's here. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, this is going to be a long one. We have four more questions. So it's not it's not that bad, but it's, it's a pretty long one. Um, so I'm personally working on a relatively edgy scene right now that depicts a lot of death. I was starting to generally wonder if there are some topics and themes that are seen as appropriate while inappropriate as portfolio work and should be kept for personal work only. Uh, when recruiting, do you think people will with overly dark... Wait, wait, before diving into that question, let's let's do the first question, right? Um, see if I can split them up real quick. So. Whoop. Okay. I was generally wondering if there are some topics and themes that are seen as inappropriate as portfolio work. Um, that's an interesting one, right? I think if, if the topics and the themes that you depict are there, are there to support the storytelling and are not just gore for gore's sake... I think that is appropriate. Um, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of just like Mortal Kombat, for example. Um, this is just like an example that we were talking about um, in the community quite recently. Because to me, I know that it supports like the whole 
the whole world of it right like this is this is like how brutal they can be but there's like there's like a limit that gets crossed for me personally and this is personally right um so yeah i don't think looking at your scene that you should be worried at all um let's have a look um my opinion on this is that you've seen it in a horror game it's probably okay um yeah that could be a good one it could be a good one um topics and themes that are inappropriate i don't yeah this is the thing right like it, it depends on what you want to do and what you want to achieve as an artist because if we're talking about portfolio work in this case and you become an, a commercial artist within the games industry i wouldn't go into like pornographic content for example um because that is that is limiting yourself to such a niche within within games right that you gotta be pretty fucking good to get a job in that inside the games industry um and i think the same applies to horror as well like say you're absolutely for whatever reason you really love sculpting like um oh my god <laughs> so dark thanks leon uh <laughs> You absolutely love sculpting like gore or whatever. Um, that is limiting your potential to be hired as a commercial artist within the games industry by such a margin that you're only looking at a couple, like a handful of companies. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, that's also, that's always what I keep in mind. Like, what is... What is my sort of target audience with my portfolio? Like, what what studios am I talking to when I show this one off? Um, bringing it back to your scene, though, I think this is still... I mean, this is way inside of the limits of what you could portray. Because that could be for, like, a detective game. This could be for, like, a cultist game. Like, um, what am I thinking about? Like, Outlast 2, for example. They probably have like some depictions like that. It's not. You don't see. Like guts being ripped out or whatever. You're. You're dressing it up in a way where it's still. It's still gruesome. It's still. It's still in your face. Like it's still. It's still horrifying to look at it. But. You're adding this layer to it where it's. Where it's not gore for gore's sake, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I assumed you didn't want to ask it for for this scene specifically, but it, it is a, it is a good example, I think, um, because if we're talking about in general, I don't think there's anything that's really off limits. Because we also live in an age where we have... I was listening to this interview yesterday about the person behind um, the Netflix series about... Um, what's it called? Like the, the Hillside Strangler or something. Like that is that is like a TV show. Like a serial killer just gone, gone awry, right? So that's... I mean, there's no topic that is that is off limits it depends on how you depict it um i think in that case they used like the real pictures but then they had to they had to uh classify like a lot of a lot of uh gruesome details on it just for respect out of out of the for for the family members and also for just that it doesn't turn into like a, a snuff kind of deal too. Oh god. This should be like an 18 plus stream at this point. Thanks Leon. Let's move on. <laughs> um, 
When recruiting, do you think people with overly dark or otherwise weird and unnormal themes depicting in their portfolio run into the risk of coming across as too weird? Um, I don't think they're they're coming across as too weird. Um, I think again, right? It's just limiting the the potential of where you're going to be hired. Um, there is going to be an aspect where they're looking at the raw technical skill that you're putting into it, but is say say your portfolio is filled of like crime scenes or whatever, you kind of send a strong message that you don't want to be working on like the next um, My Little Pony game, right? I mean, you're looking to get like a job as maybe like a a detective, like a, a detective uh, on a detective game where you're inspecting like crime scenes and all that stuff. So think about that message that you're sending. Uh, what are some of the lines you would draw? You'd say I wouldn't recommend you to show this in the portfolio. Um, gore for gore's sake, pornographic content in like a portfolio. Um, yeah, but again, like the the lines are really blurry on that one, right? Like it's it's on a case by case basis with that one. Because I can I can bet you that there's that there's people with with portfolios um oleg oleg oh i forgot his last name but he's he's just making like really gruesome stuff and he's he's also doing like putting it on his portfolio too on our station so the lines get pretty blurry we're talking about art right so I don't think there's any I don't think there's anything off limits really. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Adam. Um unless that's your market. Open up our station, there's a lot of half naked owls and skimpy armored women on the front page. Look, I don't want to call you out, but I'm not seeing that many of them. Maybe maybe people should stop browsing uh Art station a little bit too much. <laughs> and I get what you mean though. Um, yeah, this this comes back to this comes back to the question of like what do you want to be known for as an artist, right? If you want to be known for drawing half naked owls in like skimpy skimpy armor, that's up to you. I don't want to be I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known for making beautiful environments where people can imagine being in, like immersing themselves into it. Um And then there's like the whole question of for example, if you look at Patreon, like a lot of them are also just like drawing pornographic content too. So there's I mean, it's a giant market, but I just don't want to be I I just don't have any interest. If if you're looking for this quick cash grab or whatever, and you just want to get attention, I think that only hurts hurts you as an artist in the long run. Unless that is like 100% what you want to do. But let's say in an extreme example, right? You're an environment artist. You're not getting any traction on your portfolio. So you decide to make like a, like a half-naked elf, for example and then use that to to get traction to your portfolio people are going to know you for drawing or creating half naked owls not for the environments that you created no one's going to look at them so that's always that's always a thing that i look back to i always look back at like what do i want to be known for what is my niche what do i enjoy to make and then go full out on that And also, I don't think there's anything wrong with people people doing that, right? Like that's that's also the beauty of art. Like if you if you're really passionate about that stuff, just go ham. Maybe draw pretty environments with half naked elves in them. Oh, okay. You're taking it to the next level. Are you gonna do that for your next environment then? <laughs> this is gonna be like a half naked elf in the back of like one of your crime scenes. <laughs>
For some reason, the landing page for me is a lot of character art. I have to specifically filter to get more environment. Um, I honestly don't look that much at ArtStation. I usually, I open it up, I click on environment art, and that's it. Like, I don't even, I don't even browse, like, the front page anymore. I mean, I better look at ArtStation at all, so. But I get it, though. Because I've seen this complaint from, like, a lot of people, right? But I think it's also, it's so, it's so tied in to what humans are attracted to, like, over centuries, right? It's linked with our biology. Like, if, if I make, like, a beautiful, a beautiful environment, that is almost guaranteed to get less traction than a, a beautiful character model. Like, Fully clothed, whatever, right? Because there's like that attraction of like the face, like recognizable features. Whereas environment art, it turns a little bit more abstract. Or it's like people don't pay that much attention to it. Like as humans, we're trained to look at your other humans and like connect with them and like look at like all the intricacies of like their body language where environments are removed from that. They're like a step removed from that. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's that's like that's like who we are as like human beings. We're we're interested and we're attracted to other people. So I think that's also why there's always this this recurring theme. Like it's not only ArtStation, right? It's on DeviantArt. It's on whatever platform that allows that kind of stuff. They're always gonna be up front they're always going to be front and center because it's it's inherent with what we were attracted to as human beings and that's also where i think this is an assumption right if we look at students um in general what they will will try to get into is character art because that's what it, it's it links with their with what they're what they're attracted to like in i don't know how would you call it like biology or i think i think that might also be a reason why a lot of people want to do characters yeah i think i think that's an interesting topic it would be because obviously you're not talking to like a professional psychologist or like biologist here, right? You're talking to like just a normal artist. So <laughs> gotta gotta keep that into account. It would be it would be interesting to talk to like a scientist about this and just figure out with um, figure out like some some actual science behind it. Get some actual research behind it. That would be interesting. Because then once you once you kind of know the science, you can kind of kind of work within the boundaries of the science and like adapt it in your environments, right? Just make an environment full with like faces, like a tree made with like faces, just to get people's attention. <laughs> That's actually one of my problems with coming up with new ideas for environments. In my mind, there are always people in that place wait there are always people in it that add to the place for example my crime scene has four people in it that do most of the storytelling yeah that's true you can you can separate them right um with a crime scene it's pretty easy to do that because we have this stereotypical thinking of like the white outline of like most most crime scenes Oh, thanks, Banoops. Thanks for the hydrate. But I agree, though. I agree, Leon. Um, I haven't added characters to my environment. And I feel that's almost... Always to the detriment of... Of my environment. Because characters at scale, they add, like, story to it, like you said... Um, 
so that is probably like one of the things that I might experiment with in the future. Just get like a really simple character setup. Uh, look at Maximo for like the posing of it, and then then go from there. If you look at Dark Souls, for example, they are quite good with storytelling, with no narrative, simple story, but you get the vibe immediately. I think that's also because like gothic architecture is such is such like an outlier when it comes to architecture and it's also so recognizable right don't you think that has something to do with it because it is it is tightly interlinked with like just i mean there's some there's some like beautiful yeah, beautiful, like, darkness to it, to, like, gothic architecture, where you can see all the beautiful shapes, like, all the time that people spend, like, carving out those beautiful shapes. But then there's, like, this, what do you call this, like, transcendence to, like, all those shapes. Like, everything is tightly linked to, to religion in that case. And I think that's also why it's it works so well, right? Because it's so interlinked with it. Whereas if they would, oh my god, like name name something else. Um, what if you have like Dark Souls set in like I don't know anything else, like nineteen seventies, like Bauhaus architecture or whatever, right? I mean, it just falls flat. Like even if you look at like those probably from all the architectural styles gothic must be the rec the most recognizable one i think nothing quite says the golden age is, is behind us like a ruined gothic architecture yeah i think so too there's uh yeah i think that's probably like the best example Yeah, I agree. The surge, futuristic Dark Souls, not an atmospheric by a large margin. Yeah, I think... I think the consistency with the surge, from my limited playtime that I had with the surge, I think... Uh, I think I only played the surge too, I think. Um, the art design, like the... The consistency within the art was not consistent enough to create like this whole whole picture i feel i feel gameplay wise it did like a really good job but when it comes to like the environments and and just yeah the environments themselves like how they felt connected to to like the world like there there was always like no connection to it i felt i felt it was like a a mixing pot of like just a bunch of stuff thrown together this this might be like a little bit too 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 aggressive on that, but I mean, because I still respect the time that they put in for that game, right? But yeah, I do get your point. Like, I never I never had this atmospheric feeling with the surge at all. It's a really good game, though. Like the the gameplay is really fun. It's really enjoyable. And this is coming from a person that's not really a big fan of like Dark Souls games. Like, I, I get frustrated too quickly. So, take that into account. Um, but, anyway. We do have two more questions, though. Before we dive into some of the chat. Um, I think this is a good discussion point. From Nikita. It seems to be very easy to set a standard for games with a realistic graphic style. And she mentions, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a similar thing that could be applied to stylized games or is it too difficult to be agreed on on a larger scale to stylized being so broad? Um, honestly, I think realistic graphic style, if we look at that, 
it's too broad of a category. The same as stylized. Within real realistic, we do have some separate branches too. Like you would have, I don't know if they're too specific, um, but you have hyper realism where where the use of mega scans and like photorealistic textures come in. Um, what could be like another good example? I should actually look this up if there's like specific terms for like specific realistic styles because I don't think it's very easy to set a standard for games with realistic graphic styles. I think it's more nuanced. It's more nuanced in a way where you can have a look at what are some some examples? What could be an interesting example? I'm thinking currently about something like um, Battlefield, which is realistic, right? But then if you compare that to... Yeah, that's also a good point. When you compare that to... <sighs> I want to say Destiny, but then I feel like they skirt the edge between the two. Where the color usage of Destiny... The color usage of Destiny is is more like stylized and more well not stylized but like more fundamental and like like raw like uncompromising than you would expect from like a realistic example. But I would still describe Destiny as like a realistic looking game. Get the likes of Ghost of Tsushima or Spider Man, which are like percentage stylized, for example. Yeah. I think so too. I, I don't think it's easy to put like a a container on on any of these. Um, I think it's really easy if we look at the outliers where on one hand we have um, Battlefield for example. And then on the other hand we have World of Warcraft which is like super stylized. That's probably, probably like the well, the two biggest ones that I can think of. If we want to go for like another example for realism, it might be like Microsoft Flight Sim. If we want to take like the, the peak of that, because that's, I mean, that's almost hyper-realism, right? I wouldn't call it hyper-realism. Um, yeah, I don't think it's easy at all to put them, to put realistic graphic styles into like a bracket. Because... Maybe you all remember, like, this is, like, a quote-unquote famous period in games, like, the two, around 2008, where we had, like, a lot of realistic games, but they were all kind of, like, brownish tinted, right? There was, like, an era of games where realistic games were just, like, brown. But then, if you look back at it, that's, like, an artistic choice. Like, what made that realistic is probably because the color palette was more muted um, and there were some like technical limitations obviously uh, but that they're still called realistic games Naughty Dog vs Rockstar Realism yeah exactly let's have a have a think about that Have a think about that. Naughty Dog vs. Rockstar. I'm trying to think about like a specific comparison where we can where we can compare the two on like sort of equal footing. The thing that always jumps out to me is the sort of stylization or like the art direction of the foliage in, in Naughty Dog games. Where they tend to make them where they tend to make them more shiny and like more pop than what is realistic but then that's still like a realistic game oh that's a good point yeah Red Dead Redemption 2 yeah that's exactly like if we look at just if we isolate like a selection right if we just look at the foliage from The Last of Us 2 like I said before more shinier more bright more 
uh, outspoken than than Red Dead Redemption Two, where Red Dead Redemption Two is more it's sort of sort of more muted, more realistic, quote unquote. Even though that's not like a like a good word for it, I feel. But yeah, I think I think it's unfair to to have like a very easy standard for games. I think it's like like Cairo said, there's so many parameters that go into art direction for games where if yeah, like Horizon Zero Dawn is like a realistic game, but they take like a way more uh heavy approach on their like colors in their world like they're way more saturated for example so is that is that still realism is that stylized because the the stylization of the colors is what makes that game unique but then the rest of it is still is still uh realistic right so I think it's always hard to define because every game is like a separate I think you, you kind of need to see it as like they have like a row of toggles that they can move up or down and like every game has like a, a slider that's turned up or down like differently. I think it's really really interesting to talk about this but I don't think there's like a standard of realistic games. I think one thing that we do though is we we look at the next gen games that are trying to push the boundaries and then that is sort of like the realistic game, like the most quote unquote realistic game. Like for example, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. What makes that more realistic than Red Dead Redemption 2? Like, I think that that could be like an interesting question. And you can apply like any, any game to that, right? Um, so yeah, it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting topic. And I think the same applies for stylized games too, where you just have, maybe even in stylized, it's more defined. To be honest, if, we, if I'm thinking about like the purely hand painted style, um, I would say pixelated style, like you already have an idea. Um, whereas, let's call for the sake of just putting it in a bracket, like let's call Microsoft Flight Simulator, let's call that hyper realism. What does hyper realism mean? There's still, there's still some stuff in that. And then, like Cairo brought up, Ghost of Tsushima. Like, what would you even call that? I think you could call that realistic, but then that's not doing a, that's not doing a service to like Ghost of Tsushima, right? Because there's so much, so much stylization, like deliberate stylization in the art direction in that game, that makes it unique. So yeah, it's a it's an interesting topic. I don't think there's an answer to this. Um, but I definitely don't agree with that there's like a an easy standard to set for realistic games. I don't think so. Because there's so so many nuances to it. Um, and then the last question, also from Nikita. How does one go about creating an asset library? Is it just something that happens over time? Or is it created with specific things in mind like a desert scene etc um good last question to round it off um usually it happens over time but you have to take it into account you can't in most cases you 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 have to you have to keep in mind what you want to build like in the end or like how how you want to keep growing your asset library because for example in my example, if I'm going to be building a medieval scene, and then if I'm going to be building a sci-fi scene next, like none of the medieval scene stuff I can use in my sci-fi scene. So maybe at some point, if I want to create like a Viking 
inspire thing. I could maybe reuse some of the stuff that I used on my medieval scene to then turn that into like a Viking scene. That could work. Um, what people usually do when, well, the, the most effective people, what they usually do, um, I'll bring up two examples, is Tyler Smith for like a really out there stylistic example. And then on the other side, we have Martin Hoff, for example, where Martin Hoff takes this modern, um, modern team, like everything that he makes is like sort of modern, um, modern realism is that that's like his team, I would say. And then on the other side, we have Tyler, Tyler Smith, who is, just like crazy crazy shapes stylistically pleasing shapes but they're all consistent because he's making them right um they've both have probably probably built up like an asset library that say if they want to do their next thing even in martin's example let's say say he wants to do he's currently doing like a basketball court he can probably reuse like a bunch of stuff from his previous scenes like cardboard boxes like chairs like all that kind of stuff because it's still set in like the same time time range, roughly. But the same applies to Tyler Smith as well. He he has like a, an asset library with like a bunch of shapes, like a bunch of stuff in there where he can quickly build up just like environments or like places that he wants to do because he has like all the shapes to build them already. Um so I would say if if you want to become like really um what is it like really iterative or like really specific over time i would think about the sort of topic that really interests you and then maybe bite down into that and just go go crazy um so let's say for the sake of an example like your stuff is like magical stylized then all your scenes kind of need to be sort of linked to that so that you can build up this asset library of like generic prompts that maybe you could also build like a stylized uh, dungeon or like a stylized house or something like that where you can reuse the chairs from your uh, magical tower, for example, in like another scene. And slowly but surely you build up this... this uh, environment or like this asset library that you can just keep reusing over and over but it does take time it does take time i'm currently looking into how i'm building up my asset library right at this moment it's a bit too specific with the medieval prompts um and i don't think there's going to be lots of reuse. Maybe maybe in terms of like the setup for some of the textures that I can quickly just adjust to get like new variations. That could definitely be possible. Um, but just like one-to-one -one things that I can take over from one scene to the next. I don't think there's going to be too much there. Um... Yeah, something that you have to keep in mind is that you do have to keep this in mind if you're working on stuff, right? So let's say you create a chair. Um, it does need to be good enough where you can use it in like different setups. If you can, you can, you have to make it watertight where you can turn it upside down to put it on the table or something. Um, to just make it more versatile for the future. So do keep that in mind. All right, people. Been going for two hours. Let's have a look here in the chat. Prince of Persia series trilogy had some, some brownish tinted textures. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they were in the same time period, right? Like the 2008 kind of games. Um, because... It was literally like a phase where like all the games that were coming out had like this brown brown tint on top of it. Like it's 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 ridiculous. It's 
been very long and very interesting for the for the one that I caught. That's awesome, Dion. Thank you so much. All right, guys. I think this will do it for this really long session of the AMA. Um, I really thank you all so much for being here, asking good questions, being participants in discussions. I honestly appreciate you all being here. Um, but that being said, that's going to be it for me today. And I'll wish you all a good Sunday. See ya.